Good morning, Crossroads. My name is uh, Sassi Bene. I'm a theologian and I'm also a member of the teaching team here at uh, uh, Crossroads. The past, uh, I don't know, six or seven weeks, Crossroads has been on a journey, has been on a spiritual journey, understanding and learning about the grace and the mercy of God as it is poured out in Jesus Christ. And not only learning and knowing about that, but also making it your own. And as you make that mercy and grace your own, then you yourself become a person who is filled with mercy and grace. And by the Spirit of God, you are able then to live the kind of spiritual life that is on the journey. And today I am continuing, but also finishing uh, this journey with you. Augustine, the 4th century theologian, says that a journey can only be meaningful when it has an end. Being constantly on a journey, it can fill you with dread, it can fill you with panic, because you have the sense of always being on a journey but never arriving. He says a journey can only be meaningful when it has a destination when it has an arrival place, when it has a home to go to. Because when it has a home, when it has a destination, when it arrives, then you can put up with quite a lot during the journey. Then the suffering makes sense, because you know that the suffering is only, and the pain is only momentary, because you are on your way home. You are on your way to your destination. So this week and next week, it is my task here uh, to bring you home, to take you there where the journey needs to end, where the journey needs to be at. And I hope I can do that. If I did not, and if I do not manage that, then please do come talk to me and help me to figure out how to get us all home. And I hope, Ellen, I don't ruin <laughs> what you guys have built so far this last um, couple of weeks. But part of a journey sometimes what you realize that you are going a certain direction and that you might have to turn around. You might have to change course. And today as we are continuing this journey, we're going to be listening to the voice of a prophet that calls us to repentance, to turn away and to turn to God himself, to adjust our course, to adjust our journey in order for us to be able to truly arrive home and to get there. So let us read from the prophet Amos and from the prophet Micah. Now these are words that we are not usually used to reading at crossroads, reading from the minor prophets. But these voices have a very particular way of addressing us, of speaking to us. So we need to have ears to hear, eyes open to see and hearts open to receive. So let me pray for us and then allow me to read and listen to the word of God. Heavenly Father, as we are gathered here, we are thankful that we can be in your presence, that we can be gathered as your people, as your church, that you have brought us together after our holidays, that we can be in this space where, Father, we can pray and we can sing again, and we can do this together. And Father, you have heard our prayers, you have heard the longings of our hearts and of our lives. And Father, as we quiet our hearts, as we quiet our minds, as we open our eyes and ears, Father, we pray that you speak to us and allow us to hear your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm going to be reading from Amos chapter 5. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. As though he entered his house, he arrived home, and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light? pitch dark, without ray of brightness. I hate, I despise your 
religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never falling stream. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. Now from the prophet Micah. With what shall I come before the Lord? And how da <clears throat> and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with the ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and love mercy. And walk humbly with your God. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Probably these last two sentences, you have maybe seen it on Christian websites. Maybe you have seen it on tattoos. It's one of the favorite passages to be read and to be memorized and to be out there. But it comes from a very particular context. Everything that comes before is not always good news. You see, the relationship that God has with his people is a real relationship. God entered in a covenant with his people in order for that covenant to become the kingdom of God, to be the rule of God. And that's a very real thing. The kingdom of God is not just an idea. It's not just a theological concept that you can look up in a dictionary and then just be happy that you know what the concept means. No, it is reality. It is God relating to his people, and as he relates to his people, those people become a certain kind of people. That this covenant of God with the people, it plays out in interpersonal relationships. It plays out in the families. It plays out in the village. It plays out in the city. It plays out in the land. And when it all works, that's when you can look at a country and you can say that that's where the kingdom of God is. Because in the kingdom of God, those who have nothing are lifted up. Those who are weak and vulnerable are cared for. Those who stay behind because they cannot afford to go on holiday are also comforted. Those mothers who are caring for their children in the hospital, they are also cared for. And that's what the kingdom of God should look like. Where people who are marginalized, who are not seen, who are not the celebrities, the people who do not make the news, that they are the ones who are actually taken care of. That's what the kingdom of God means. But the kingdom of God also breaks down. And that's when the prophets come around. That's when we have to read the scriptures and hear words like, Woe to you! I hate your worship services. Welcome back from the holidays, Crossroads. <laughs> I didn't ask for this. <laughs> but this is the voice of God that is meeting us this morning, that is calling us to hear and to see. 
We have to engage with the voice of God that is at times, Whoa! I hate! I despise what you are doing. I'm sending you into exile, away from home. Because you are not living in the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is for those people whom usually are not seen. Those who were not able to catch the waves of progress and for outgang. For those people who didn't really make it in this life. Those who cannot afford to buy a house. Those who cannot afford their holidays. Those who have to count the hours and how long they're allowed to stay with their beloved ones in the hospital. Those who are counting the days of their beloved ones dying. You see, it is for them and the kingdom of God is meant to mean something. To mean maybe everything. But when all of this breaks down, you see, when religion and worship become something self-serving, when religion and worship becomes about the rules and the regulations, what you're allowed to eat and when and how and how to dress and what it is that you are allowed to have and what it is that you are not allowed to have. That's when it all breaks down. When the kingdom of God becomes about power, about self-serving power and protecting those who have seemingly everything in this life. That's when we see the kingdom of God break down. That's when on the journey we need to have a voice that calls us back to God himself, for us to turn away from our own designs and to turn to God himself. This is the voice, this is the word of the Lord this morning to us. You see, a life of worship is really hard crossroads. Sometimes I'm wondering what does our prayers what does us singing about the goodness of God on Sunday morning, what does us listening to the word of God and blessing each other have to do with what is happening in the city, in the neighborhood, in the flat that we are living? What does it all have to do with reality itself? It is almost like driving in an air-conditioned car through the slums and the townships of this world, listening to Elevations Church's latest highly produced worship song, and then pondering about the suffering and the pain of this world. You see, it's really hard for us here in the West to understand something of the kingdom of God, to understand something of the pain and the suffering of this world. And I'm afraid that sometimes we use worship as an escape, as an opium, as a shot, as a drug, for us to just escape from the realities of this world and be here and just be okay for an hour. You see, movies do that to us as well. We can go to the movies and for two hours you can escape and go to Avatar, you know? You can, <laughs> you can be there for two hours and escape the realities of this world, the pain and the suffering of this world. But I think worship is much more than an escape. I think worship has a promise in it. It invites us actually to see and to hear and to taste the goodness of God. Worship invites us to see those who are not seen in this world. For us to see the world the way God sees this world. For us to hear not only the noise and the news and everything that we are used to, but to actually hear the words of God being spoken into our lives. Not only that, but also to taste, to taste the goodness of God here in worship together. To taste the goodness of God in the life of those who are not blessed, who don't have their lives together, who didn't make it, who didn't climb on the ladder of success, and to see the goodness of God, and to hear and to taste 
the goodness of God being poured out exactly in their lives. The spiritual journey with God at times asks us to turn from our own self-determined lives and turn to God. To actually see the world for once the way God sees the world. To see the people that God sees and cares about. To see the kingdom of God also realized at times. Not in the lives of the successful, but in the lives of the broken ones. Of those who do not have their lives together. And finally, what we see is that God is a teacher, and he's a very different teacher than I am. Usually, the way I teach, I stand in front of a class, I say things, and I hope it lands, and I hope the students learn something, and then at the end of the semester, we give each other some grades, and we move on. But God is also a teacher, but he's a very different kind of teacher. And if you have heard in Micah, God says, but God has shown you what he wants. God is the kind of show-and-tell teacher. You see, God not only tells us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with Him, but God also incarnates His words. God lives those words, and where we see those words lived out mostly, we see them in the person of Jesus Christ. It is He who lived and who acted justly. It is He who loved mercy. It is He who has walked humbly with God. And today, Crossroads, I want to tell you that all of that, all of that that is in Christ, is hidden even in our baptism. Because we have died together with Christ and risen to new life. Therefore, there is a chance for us also to live like that, to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. You see, if we divorce all of that from Jesus, then we have to have our own interpretation of what justice means. We have to kind of figure out what does really mercy mean. We have to figure out what does it mean to do that humbly with God. But this summer the invitation has been to follow after Jesus. And to follow after him in such a way that you become like him. And in following him and becoming like him, you become a person who acts justly. Who loves Mercy, who walks humbly with God. You see, the call this morning and the call of, of God this morning is for us to realize and, 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 and to see that when your life is hidden in Christ, that in a world that is power-hungry, in a world that we live in that is so dominated by the powerful in this world. That in that world, we can act and we can act justly. That in a world that is fueled by violence, and not only violence, but the circle of violence. I'm going to hurt you because you have hurt me. And then he's going to hurt me because I hurt him. And then we're just going to go in this endless cycle of violence. That in that endless cycle of violence, God is calling us to actually love mercy. To extend forgiveness. What did Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them because they have no idea what it is that they are doing. And finally, in a world of self-determination, in the world of the ego, in the world of 
of influencers and of having to make it in this world, I think there's another path, there's another way possible. There's another kind of life is possible, and that is the kind of life that walks humbly with God. Again, the Christian life, brothers and sisters, is not an easy life. And let me tell you, it's not for everybody. <laughs> and the reason why is this. You see, Jesus lived in such a way that he acted justly, that he loved mercy, and he walked humbly with God. And all it got him is the cross on Golgotha. Now, if you think that somehow applying this strategy to your life, that as long as I act justly, as long as I love mercy, as long as I walk humbly with God, somehow my life is fulfilled. Think again. <laughs> the same kind of life that Jesus has, the same kind of life that awaits us. And that's the good news of the gospel, brothers and sisters. That's the good news. Of, that's the home that we are on our way to. To become less like ourselves and to become more like Jesus. And it takes a journey. It takes a lifelong journey of maybe two steps ahead and one step back. With big detours, not the shortcuts. But that's where we are journeying towards. Today I just introduced this idea to you and next week we're going to unpack it maybe even in more real terms. How does a life look like that acts justly? A life that loves mercy. And how does a life look like that walks humbly with God? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, as you have gathered us in your presence by your Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that you allow your words to take root in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives, so that we truly can live lives that act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, now and forevermore. In your name we pray. Amen.